Thank you for listening to the Bayina Institute podcast. Please join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bayina Institute, or you can join our email list at httpbayina.com and share these recordings with your family and friends. In alhamdulillah, alladhi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا والذي أوحينا إليك وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه كبر على المشركين ما تدعوهم إليه الله يجتبي إليه من يشاء ويهدي إليه من ينيب وما تفرقوا إلا من بعد ما جاءهم العلم بغيا بينهم ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك إلى أجل مسمى لقضي بينهم وإن الذين أورثوا الكتاب من بعدهم لفي شك منه مريب رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين Inshallah, in today's khutbah, I'd like to share with you some reflections and some parts of three ayat that belong to Surah Al-Shura. This is the 42nd Surah of the Qur'an. And in these three ayat, there are many, many lessons, but I want to focus on one particular strand, one particular line of thought that is critical for all Muslims today. Especially in light of what's recently been happening, I don't think anyone in the audience today is unaware of what's going on in the Muslim world and the recent events that have taken place. And I'm sure you've had discussions in this masjid, khutbahs across the country and even across the world addressing this issue. But I wanted to actually address it from a different angle and really address something entirely separate. And that is the attitude of a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ had a very difficult mission. And in the, the audience that he was conversing with, he had certain advantages. One of those advantages was they knew him. Forty years before he even opened his mouth as a messenger, these people knew the, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at a personal level, at a professional level. They knew him in his business dealings, they knew him in his family, they knew his tribe, they knew his character. They've seen him as one of their own young come up. So they know him very, very personally. And of course, when you know somebody personally, that already breaks certain, you know, uh, uh, certain barriers of communication. You can talk to somebody a lot easier when you know them, as opposed to when you don't. And it's a lot easier to listen to somebody who you have a good opinion of, as opposed to listening to someone you don't have a good opinion of. Allah already went on to tell us, and actually Quran, not Quran, but Sirah books already go on to tell us, that the Prophet ﷺ enjoyed a very high reputation among the Meccans, before even be declaring that he's a messenger, before receiving revelation, a sadiq wal amin, the Arabs of that time, especially the Meccans, were not really known for giving compliments. They were actually much more known for throwing insults. For them to give a compliment is not a small thing, it's a pretty big deal. That they, were, they had given these compliments to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's obviously one of the great advantages of the Prophet Sallallahu when he has to deliver this message. Another really good advantage he has is that Allah has given him a miraculous gift, the Qur'an. So the message he has to deliver, you know when a speaker has to get up and speak, he has to think, well what should I say first and what should I say second? 
how is the best way, what's the best possible way I can deliver this idea to somebody else. And depending on who I'm talking to, I might have to change the way I organize my thoughts or how I put my sentences together. So speakers have to go through drafts and redrafts and redrafts and redrafts. But the Prophet ﷺ, when he's delivering the speech, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have that problem. His speeches are pre-drafted by Allah Himself. It's the surahs of the Quran that he's reciting. He's not speaking on his own whim, he's not making stuff up. He's actually being given the perfect speech for the perfect occasion. And it's not like the Messenger of Allah والسلام, would choose the time when surah, which surah should be recited. Surah Al Isra tells us the Quran, Allah Himself separated it so you can recite it onto the people at the right occasion. When the right time comes, the surah will come and you can recite it onto them. So the perfect speech for the perfect time coming from an individual whose reputation is already respected. I say all of this in the beginning of my khutbah because there's a lot of reasons for which the Meccans who are listening to the Prophet ﷺ, especially those that are closest to him personally, there are a lot of reasons for them to accept this message. There are a ton of reasons, this is a very good ingredient to coming together. That, that if they come together, this perfect storm of guidance, you know, there's all the reasons to accept this message. But nearly a decade goes by and not much has changed. Not much has changed. Most of his family has not become Muslim. Actually, they become more and more antagonistic towards Islam. And all of those things that work to the Prophet's advantage وسلم, don't seem like they're enough. They just don't seem to be enough. They're not budging from their position. And if you've been trying to talk to somebody for a long time, You've been trying to change somebody's attitude for a long time. You talk to them once, twice, three times, four times, a year, two years, in this case, ten years almost now. You've been talking to the same group of people for a very long time, and somebody comes to you and says, listen, these guys are a lost cause, why do you even bother? I mean, if they haven't listened to you for the last nine years, for the last ten years, why would they listen to you now? Don't you get it? They're not going to listen. It's too difficult for them. When somebody comes and talks to you in this way to try to discourage you and say, you know what, look, you tried, thanks for trying, but these guys are past, lost case. They're terminal case. They're at a point of no return. Don't even bother with them. Well, any normal human being would be discouraged. They would be discouraged. They would say, you know what, you're right. These people, maybe these people aren't worth it. But you know what? What if Allah Azza wa Jal Himself, Himself, says to the Prophet وسلم, in the ayah I recited before you, كَبُرَ عَلَى الْمُشْرِكِينَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ It is a big deal for the people of shirk, for the people that are making partners with Allah, the idol worshippers, these mushrikun of Makkah particularly. It is too big a deal for them to accept what you're inviting them to. It's too much for them. It's not just anybody coming and giving the Prophet these words, it's Allah Himself saying it's way too big a deal for them. And if the Prophet's mission on the one hand Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to deliver this message to them. And who gave him that mission? Allah Himself did. And on the other hand, Allah Himself is telling the Prophet Sallallahu these people, it's too big, too hard for them. Wouldn't that be demoralizing? Why would Allah Azzawajal tell His Prophet والسلام, look, you've got a really tough customer base. These guys are just hard-headed. I know you're the best possible messenger humanity's ever seen. This is the best possible message humanity has ever received. But even though that's the case, and even though this message has been delivered specifically in their language, the perfect speech at the perfect time, 10 years of it, nothing has changed. It's too hard for them to accept. It's too much. The demands you're placing on them with Islam are too much. The Prophet ﷺ is told all of this not so he can quit. He's not told this so he can quit. It's, he's told this so he can be clear. The reason he's told that it's too hard for the mushrikun to accept Islam is not so he gets depressed and says, if Allah says it, then what's the point? What's the point of bothering with these people? The very next words in the ayah, in the ayah are the words of clarity. Allahu yajtabi ilayhi man yasha wa yahdi ilayhi man yuneeb. Allah in fact is the one. He selects towards Himself. 
He drafts. Literally, the word yajtabi is close to the word draft. He drafts for himself whoever he wants. And he brings back, or he guides towards himself the people who turn towards him. May you name whoever's going to turn back. In other words, you can do the best job you can possibly do, but guiding somebody is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to deliver a message to even this impossible audience. I will in the end pick who I will pick. Allah says to the, to the Messenger The selection is not yours, it's mine. I get to make the choices. So the same speech will be heard by an entire crowd, but one kid Ali will raise his hand and say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Radiallahu anhu, right? He, he's gonna say it. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad an abduhu wa rasul. They're all listening to the same speech. But Allah chooses one. Then Allah chooses another. Then Allah chooses another. All the rabbis of Bani Israel in Medina heard the message of Islam. They all heard it. But you have Abdullah ibn Salam accepting Islam. You have one of them accepting. Allah chooses. Allah doesn't just pick anybody, He chooses. There were two great leaders, elite, that the, mush the mushrikun looked up to, Amr and Umar. Allah chooses one of them. The Prophet ﷺ is inviting both of them equally. And it's so amazing that in the Qur'an, رَأَيْتَ إِن كَانَ عَلَى الْهُدَى Allah even talks about the potential of Abu Jahl. He could have been awesome. <laughs> Did you see? If he had been commanded, he, if he had been committed to guidance, in kana ala al huda, aw amara bit taqwa, or if he had commanded to taqwa, he would have been awesome. Abu Jahl's potential that the Prophet saw, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's why he made du'a for him, right? That maybe give me one of the two Umar, Umar al Amr. The reason he made that du'a is the Prophet saw potential, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And it's not just the Prophet. Quran also acknowledges if that guy became Muslim, it would have been amazing. <laughs> Even Quran declares declares that. But at the end of the day, the Prophet's efforts are on one hand, the ones who will come to guidance are on the other. That is not the Prophet's concern. لَيْسَ عَلَيْكَ هُدَاهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah tells His Messenger, you're not responsible for guiding them. Allah guides to him whoever he wants. But regardless, the point, the first point I wanted to make before all of you, is that Allah Himself said, the people you are talking to, this is a very hard sale. They're not easy customers. كَبُرَ عَلَى الْمُشْرِكِ It's too big a deal for them. It's heavy on them, it's huge for them to accept what you're saying. But if that's the case and the Muslims also hear that, that the mushrikun of Mecca, well why wouldn't they listen? So some thoughts might come in your mind. You might say, well the mushrikun of Mecca, <coughs> they don't, they're not Christians and they're not Jews. And they're not people that believe in prophets from before. And they're not people that have an understanding of the afterlife or tawheed. They are a pagan, idol-worshipping culture. For them something like revelation, Angels, Tawheed, the oneness of God, the uniqueness of Allah, you know, previous revelations, previous scripture, all of this stuff is new to them. So if that's the case, maybe the Muslims become more optimistic about the situation in Medina. Because in Medina, who lives there? Jews and Christians lived there at the, Christians lived there at the time. Well, those people know a book, don't they? That's why they're called Ahlul Kitab, they're people of a book. And they know revelation, so maybe when they hear this Qur'an, it will resonate with them. They'll say, okay, this is what we believe in. As a matter of fact, some people who heard this message from the people of the book, you know, وَإِذَا يُطْلَ عَلَيْهِمْ قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِهِ إِنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مُسْلِمِينَ When they hear this message, they're like, we believe in it. This is absolutely the truth that came from our Master. We were already in submission even before we heard this. In other words, even though I hadn't come into contact with the Qur'an, my heart was already Muslim. This is completely confirming what I had in my heart. So the Muslims are thinking, maybe when we go to Medina, our job will be a lot easier. They're th that group, the Jews and the Christians, are going to be way more willing to listen. Keep in mind, the surah I'm sharing with you today, this small passage I'm sharing with you today, is not a Madani passage, it's a Makki passage. So the Muslims actually don't yet know what's going to happen in Medina. They don't know that yet. What does Allah say about the people of the book in the next ayah? Allah Azza wa says, وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمِ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ they didn't fall into disagreement until after knowledge came to them out of rebellion and out of an urge of ego and domination that they, they wanted one to dominate the other. That's the only urge that let them argue among each other and be in division despite having knowledge. After they had knowledge. 
So the thing is, Mushrikun did not accept Islam because they don't have previous knowledge. Muslims are hoping Christians and Jews will accept Islam because they have previous knowledge. And Allah says in the next ayah, actually, they've been fighting each other and they fell into disagreement, not because they didn't have knowledge, but even though they had knowledge, even after they had knowledge, because they have too much pride among each other. Baghiyam baynahum. They want to have one group dominate over the other. This urge to rebel within them keeps, this urge to dominate within them keeps even their knowledge from benefiting them. Subhanallah. On the one hand, the Prophet is told the mushrikun are a tough sale. On the other hand, there he's told that the Jews and Christians of Medina, the vast majority of them, even if they have knowledge, it's not going to make much of a difference. Actually, even after knowledge, they disagree. All and by the way, who are the Prophet's audience? Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's only three. There's only two audiences really. There's on the one hand the people of Shirk, on the other hand the people of the Book. That's it. Those are the two audiences of the Prophet, in the, in his lifetime. And both of them in this passage, he's been told, both of them aren't very easy, you know, they're not easily turning to Islam. That's not going to happen. And their knowledge is not even going to help. All the reasons given why the Prophet's job, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is impossible. He's not going to see much results. It's just not going to work out. And after he's told all of this, maybe he's thinking, okay, these guys, they're older, they're knowledgeable, and they become arrogant in their religion. Maybe their next generation, Maybe their children will become better than them. You remember how the Prophet ﷺ made, made, uh, had hope in the children of Taif? When the angel comes and makes the offer, should I take them out? And he says, no, 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 maybe their children will say, La ilaha illallah one day. So he has hope in the future. What does Allah say about the people of the book? وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكٍ مِنْهُ مُرِيبٍ And no doubt about it, those who are given the book and inheritance after them are also in doubt. They've got shak, they've got doubts about it too. So the original generation is lost in argument and arrogance. The people of shirk, it's too hard for them to accept. And the new generation is lost in what? They're lost in doubt. They're lost in doubt. So your message is not going to resonate with any of these. They're all lost causes. And when the Prophet hears this Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the logical assumption you and I should have is that he should give up. Why even bother then? If they're not going to listen, why am I even talking? I mean, imagine you're talking to somebody and people are getting up and walking away. What would any normal speaker do? Well, why am I even talking now? Everybody's walking away. I should just stop. But what does Allah say to the Messenger ﷺ? These words and the wisdom in the following words, they're very small words. But they, and it's very hard to explain their wisdom. And I pray to Allah that He gives me clarity in speech that I can communicate to you the depth of what is being said in the next words. Because it's life changing, it really is. To me at least, it's life changing. Allah would have said, would, he didn't say this, what I'm about to say, he didn't say this, he would have said, look, you've got all these reasons, all these problems, all these obstacles, despite them, fad'u, keep on inviting. The word despite, I want to pay attention to a little bit. I'm expecting to hear, عَلَى الرَّغْمِ مِنْ كُلِّ ذَلِكْ فَدْعُوا, اُدْعُوا أنت. Despite all of these problems, you keep doing what you're doing. I know you have all these issues that I've list, I myself, Allah Himself has listed those issues for you, but despite them, keep on working. That's not what Allah said. Allah said, فَلِذَلِكَ Not عَلَى الرَّغْمِ مِنْ ذَلِكْ عَلَى ذَلِكْ Not لِذَلِكَ فَدْعُوا It's very small words. For that reason, I'm going to translate now and hopefully I can explain clearly. For that reason, you should invite. For that reason, you should invite. Now think about that. All the, th the entire passage before were reasons why the Prophet shouldn't even bother. And Allah says, look, you have an impossible audience number one, the mushrikun of Mecca. You have an impossible audience number two, the people of the book who have knowledge and still argue. You have an impossible audience number three, the children, the next generation of them that are lost in doubt. And because you have three very difficult, very impossible audiences, that's why you should invite. Because you are the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, because you have such a high status, have very high obstacles in front of you. Those are the reasons, that's the reason you've been chosen. It's your job to deal with these problems, because no other human being on the face of this earth 
can deal with these, I don't, Allah doesn't see anybody else qualified to deal with those problems like our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What I'm trying to get across to you, if I can be clear, is the, the colossal, the monumental nature of the problems. Allah highlighted them to let the Messenger know these problems exist and that's why I chose you. These problems exist not to depress you, but actually you were sent to, to address these problems. I will guide who I guide, but your job is to invite and keep on working, even if they don't accept what you're saying. You stay at it. وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ And stay firm and stay on target, stay straight, just like you've been commanded. وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ These are incredible words. And the reason I'm bringing up this passage in particular, and this conversation between Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in particular, is for a reason. There's one, there are many awesome Muslim habits nowadays. And one of them, you and I know very, very well. We love sitting together and talking about the problems of the Ummah. The problems of the Muslims. Man, the government of this and this and this. Oh man, the Muslims are doing this and this and this. Man, the kuffar do this and this and this against us. Oh God, we're so ignorant. There's so much, you know, corruption in the Ummah. There's so much, you know, uh, corruption in the politics of the Ummah. And we don't have any knowledge. And our, this is corrupt and that's corrupt and this is going wrong and that's going wrong. We love sitting together, having some chai, having some biscuits, having some baklawa and talking about how things are going wrong. How everything is falling apart. We love doing it. It's entertainment for us. Other people watch sports and complain about how their teams aren't doing well. We talk about the Ummah and how, how ruined it is, how hopeless it is. It's a lost cause. These people are, you know, people sit there talk about Pakistan. These people, man, forget about it. That's a lost cause. People talk about the youth. People talk, every, every aspect of the Muslim community, we just love it, we're obsessed with it. You know there are corporations in this country, multi-million dollar, billion dollar corporations that have a set budget just on fixing attitudes of managers and executives because they understand the power of a positive attitude and how it affects their bottom line. They're not doing it because they like everybody to be happy, they're doing it because they know it affects their profits when employees aren't positive. Even in the dunya sense, they believe in the power of optimism. For a Muslim, it's not even dunya. Optimism is part of our iman. Being optimistic that things are going to get better is part of our iman. The Prophet ﷺ is told all the reasons to be negative, to be pessimistic. But he's told actually you should be optimistic because you have Qur'an. You've been given the message to deliver. Your job is to address these impossible problems, not complain about them. <laughs> not complain about them. We look at the state of the Ummah today and we get depressed, we really do. We watch the news every day and we get more and more and more depressed. And I argue, you and me, the further we become from the Qur'an, the more depressed we're going to be. Because we're not seeing those problems as our mission. We're not seeing those problems as the reason Allah chose you and me to live in this age. If you and I have been given breath in this time, in 2012, and you and I have been given La ilaha illallah on our tongue, if we have been given that, then we are of the people Allah expects something from them. When they see the problems around them, they should say, فَلِذَلِكَ adru. <laughs> That's why I should open my mouth. That's why I should do something. That's why Allah put me in the time that He put me in. We have to be the force of positive change. We have to be the people that op invite people. Just talk, just say something. Don't say nothing changes. People, brother, there are khutbahs, there are talks. Nothing ever changes. You don't decide what changes and doesn't change. That's up to Allah. Even Allah told His Messenger وسلم, that He's not in charge of changing anything. He's not in charge of guiding anybody. That's Allah's responsibility. So it is not becoming of you. It's inappropriate of you and me to sit around and say, Oh brother, nothing's gonna change. Don't say that because that's a problem of Iman. We don't think like that. Quran affected our attitudes. Things change is in the hands of Allah. So long as we do our part, the help of Allah will come. We don't do our part, we can't complain about the help of Allah not coming. فَلِذَلِكَ فَدْعُوا وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ So you keep on inviting. Stay firm as you've been commanded. And don't fall into their desires. 
don't fall into their whims. In these last five minutes, I want to share something with you. In one of the main lessons of this passage, these few words, is the Prophet ﷺ is commanded to stay on target, stay focused. And you know when you tell somebody to stay focused, is when there are a lot of distractions available, huh? When there are a lot of distractions, you have to give instructions to stay focused. You just stay firm on what you've been told and you keep on inviting. And don't follow their desires. Here desires actually doesn't mean wealth and dunya, because we know the Prophet wouldn't follow any of that. Don't give in to their distractions actually. What they really want is for you to talk about something else. They want to change the subject. They want, listen to this carefully folks, they want to change the subject. They don't want you to stay focused. This ummah has a focus to call themselves, each other and the world back to Allah. To call the world to justice, to call the world to, fame, to, to, you know, to fairness. That's the job of this ummah. But then these people will throw in distractions. And we will be distracted by them and forget what we're here for. SubhanAllah, how easily we get distracted. How easily. One of the thinkers in the Arab world actually describes Muslim youth today like the bull in a bullfight. You know the red cape? You just wave it a little bit and the bull goes. There's no, there's no intellectual, ah, this guy's playing with me again last time I got injured because this guy. No, 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 no. You just have to wave the red flag and the, the herd will come out. We don't have to think about anything. We can run by emotions. We don't even understand what our own agenda is. What our own, what Muslims have an agenda. We have a purpose. We have a mission. What is it? And how are we so easily taken off our agenda? How is it so easily we get distracted? These things are just distractions. At the end of the day, that's all they are. If you and I are offended, and we should be, that the Prophet ﷺ is being insulted. We should be offended that the Prophet ﷺ is being mocked and he's being made fun of. But you know, you know we have to remember that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ left you and me with a responsibility. فَلْيُبَلِّغِ الشَّاهِدِ الْغَائِبِ Then the one who's here better deliver the message to the one who's not here. And when you and I are not part of the solution of spreading the word of Allah in our own family even. I don't even talk about go on the, on the radio station and talk about Islam. How much are we even teaching our own family? How much does your next door neighbor, you live with him for 10 years, how much does he even know about Islam? Does he even, has he even heard the word Allah before? Has he even heard that before from you? Has he even known what the Prophet is like وسلم, from your mouth? If we haven't even done that, then who is offending the Prophet's legacy? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu put us in charge of delivering his message. And the Prophet Sallallahu is not hurt by the kuffar and what they say. He, the, he can't be hurt by that. He can't, they can't hurt Islam. But you know what? The disappointing behavior of the ummah. The lack of direction for the ummah. Now there's something the ummah should be worried about. There's something we should protest. There's something we should really be offended by, deeply concerned by. How far have we come from the Prophet's way, alayhi salatu wasalam? You know? These kinds of things, you can look at them, these kinds of incidents, and this is not going to be the last of them. It's not going to be the last of them. You can see them as something negative, or you could find an opportunity in it. Every challenge Allah puts our way is an opportunity. I see it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for one-fifth of the, of the world's population, the Muslim population of the planet, one-fifth of it, to engage in a positive conversation about our Prophet ﷺ. It's an opportunity now, hey, you've been following the news, let me tell you something about our Prophet. I want to sit down and introduce him to you. You know? We can actually now use this as a means to do more da'wah than ever before. What is supposed to be an attempt to hurt the Prophet ﷺ and hurt Islam can be turned into an opportunity to share the message of Islam like never before. We have to learn to take these things like opportunities. Use the weapons that are thrown at us and turn them right back around and not be distracted from our purpose. I leave you with this, it's already 2.15, I leave you with this. Musa السلام, when he spoke to Fir'aun was insulted multiple times. Fir'aun called him a magician. Fir'aun finally called him a magician. Before that he called him crazy. He called him a liar. He called him a bunch of names in one conversation. <coughs> he insulted him over and over and over and over again. And you know what's amazing about Musa in the Quran? 
in that entire conversation, read it yourself, 26 surah, surah number 26, read that conversation. Not once did Musa alayhi salam respond to any of the insults. All he kept saying in response is, Rabbul Mashariqi wal Magharibi wa ma baynahuma. Rabbukum wa Rabbu abaikum wal awaleen. Rabbul Samawati wal ard. He would say, he's crazy. He'd say, no, actually, my master is the master of the skies and the earth. My Allah is the master of the skies and the earth. He'd say, he's a liar. Actually, let me tell you something more. He's not only the master of the skies and the earth, he owns both the east and both the west. I say, he's a magician. He says, my master, he owns you, all of you, and your ancestors. He's only talking about Allah. <laughs> Fir'aun is talking about Musa, but Musa is talking about Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah put that in the Qur'an for a reason, people. Allah put that in the Qur'an for a reason. He's teaching us how Musa salam wouldn't be distracted. He wouldn't get distracted. We should stay on target. We should learn not to get distracted. May Allah Azza wa really make us a people of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Azza wa teach this Ummah not to be reactionary, but to draw from the guidance of His book and to apply it in the best possible way in this life for the benefit of themselves and the benefit of the rest of humanity. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.